the, there's a change in American life that is not um, conducive to well-being, to, mm -hmm. to say the least. And I think that that really start the, the, that trajectory started with Reagan. Hi, this is uh, Frank Schaefer, and this is my podcast in conversation with Frank Schaefer. Um, and this is a Facebook Live event that it then can be found on Facebook again as a recording and on YouTube, and then a little later as a podcast where podcasts are seen. And one little housekeeping note here, and that is people who want to get in touch with this author or buy her book or any of those good things, you don't have to scratch around later because we will post everything and we will link to anything that our guest wants. So today I'm talking with Candy Leonard. Um, usually Ernie, my, my producer, puts things in the notes here and um, I try to read from them, but I'd rather read from the cover of her book which is right here that we're going to be talking about because um, it's filled with my notes and I got it in the best possible way that Candy sent it to me because she's read a few things of mine. And this is Beatleness, How the Beatles and Their Fans Remade the World by Candy Leonard. This is the book we'll be talking about and a lot of stuff to do with it. Candy's a sociologist, um, qualitative research consultant and the author of, and we just talked about this, um, so Candy, just housekeeping a little bit, what, what are you doing besides writing this wonderful book, which we're going to spend 90% of this on? Just tell me for the sake of people listening, who you are, what you're doing. Uh, I see a lot of books in the background. I know you've written other things. Describe your life and, and, and what it is you're all about for a minute before we get into this book. Okay. Anything you want, you can make stuff up or tell me the truth, whatever you like. Okay, well, um, I'm a, I wrote Beatleness. Uh, I want I, I had wanted to write this book my whole life, and I uh, it came out to, to for the 50th anniversary of Beatlemania 2014, then the paperback in 2016, which was six years ago. So, in answer to your question, what what am I? What else am I doing? I've done some writing since, some articles, and I have a chapter in a uh, academic volume on the Beatles. So I continue to write about the Beatles, but. I'm really more, I mean, as obviously they are hugely important to me and I believe to our generation, which we'll get into, but I, I, uh, I want to go broader than that. And I want to write about other things, other pressing things, which I'm beginning to do. I set up my website, candyleonard.com last year. Mm. And um, I, I'm an activist in my own way, but it, or, actually I'm an activist and I also consider myself an artist, but I'm, I'm kind of searching for the medium of mm. what the art is and the best platform for what I want to do. I mean, I've done a lot, you know, do volunteering for different political campaigns. In fact, before this uh, midterm election, which I was really quite um, concerned about the outcome of, as I'm sure many of us were, uh, spent days and days on the phone calling voters all over the country, mm -hmm. you know, volunteering for different campaigns. So I, I'm staying busy, staying engaged. But as far as like my next big thing, I don't know. I'm well, let's sure. cut to the chase here just for a second before yeah. we dive into the book, because I have so much I want to talk to you about. I've got notes here, all kinds of stuff. I'm well prepared. Um, but I just want to cover a couple personal things. You know, if someone asks me what I do, you know, then obviously in the, in the context of a podcast, they're expecting me to just talk about my writing and that I do this, that, and the other. But actually, in, the, in, in terms of my real life, day-to-day, -day, what I care about, once we've done this podcast, I'll be going to the, to the preschool, the, the school where I pick up my youngest granddaughter. She's eight now. Um, and I'll and I will take care of her for the rest of the afternoon. I would I would describe myself more honestly as a hands on grandfather who takes care of three of his five grandchildren more than I would a writer. Uh, if it was over a cup of coffee and we'd met on an airplane, if it's in this context, we talk about our books and so forth. Sure. So just take a minute before we dive in. Tell me about yourself personally to the degree okay. you feel comfortable. Who Who are you in terms of who you are? not professionally, but um, just kind of how do you see yourself? Okay. Um, I had a, an experience just this past weekend that I can maybe use as, an, as a way to answer that question. I participated in something called Ladies Rock Camp. Okay. Um, Good. An organization that um, 
it's uh, Boston Girls Rock Camp, and they do a program for adults to mm. f- to raise, you know, fundraise for the uh, youth program. And uh, it was just a wonderful experience of a bunch of strangers coming together, don't know each other. By the end of the weekend, we were actually together for th- over the weekend for like approximately 33 hours. We formed bands, wrote songs, and performed them. Oh, I love and- that. Fantastic experience. And um, I love the song I wrote. I actually would like to do something with it. Um, But that's an example of sort of part of me that I didn't get to do. Okay, which actually relates back to the book as well. Um, I am a mother, as you know, because we connected because you know my daughter, Dana. Uh, I have a son, Adam, um, and I have two grandsons. And, um, you know, my day to day life, um, you know, I mean, I'm sort of living the life of, I guess, what you might say is a retired person, but I don't consider myself retired because in many ways I don't feel like I ever started. Right. <laughs> you know, which is why I had to go to ladies rock camp this past weekend. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a gardener. I'm a, I'm a voracious reader. Um, yeah just recently took up um sewing again but what i'm doing is really not sewing because i discovered improv quilting was allowed and it's a thing Mm -hmm. so i've been doing this amazing um project with fabric Mm. um i'm really very much in an exploration stage Mm. i guess um but i have a lot yeah go ahead go ahead i was gonna say that um you know, I I don't know how much longer I'm going to be around, but it could be a while. It could be a while. I hope so. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty healthy, and um, I'm trying to figure out how, what is the best use of my time, skills, mm-hmm. background, uh, education. I get. I mean, I feel a very strong responsibility. I guess. Um, for a variety of reasons, just mm-hmm. like my upbringing, just my values, and just what I see around me, that I have. I'm very privileged in a lot of ways. I have a lot of resources and um, experiences that I feel um, can, I want to share them in a way that's yeah. going to make a difference. I mean, it sounds so try, I want to make a difference, but I do. Well, you <laughs> so. know, let me let me jump into the book because again, uh, we're talking about Beatleness here and it's six years old, but it was new to me in that, Candy, you sent me this, what, a few months ago, I think. And then my wife, Jeannie, snagged it first and she read it. And then I took it with us on a trip and I read it. And f- the first thing I want to say is you're a terrific writer. You really are. I was a little worried when it was a book on the on, on Beatles and the Beatles culture, Beatleness by a sociologist. I'm always a little scared when anybody who has obvious academic chump chops jumps in on cultural analysis. But I, I honestly can say this to people. If the Beatles have been any part of your life, as they were mine. And I'll get into that personally for just a second here. Um, You literally cannot miss this book because I've read quite a bit on the Beatles. I have a cousin, Jonathan, who knew Paul McCartney quite well, lived in his house at the apex of his career for a while, Paul's career that is. Um, Had a weird connection with the Beatles through my parents' ministry of Labrie Fellowship and that Yoko Ono's divorced husband came and hid out at Labrie for a while with her daughter. So uh, he wouldn't have to get involved in a custody battle with Lennon and and Yoko. I didn't know them personally, but the big story for me is not that. And I'm going to show you something here. You you may recognize this as the cover of uh, one of their albums. It looks this, vaguely familiar. Yeah, th- vaguely familiar. Uh, might ring a bell. Abbey Road um, is the album I met Jeannie over. I've been married for 53 years. This is not a facsimile. This is the album that I played her the night we met. She was upstairs in the Libri dining room. I was 17. She was 18. Gorgeous. Walked in. I made sure she was sitting next to me. We talked. And within moments, and we could be in your book. And by the way, I'll talk about the book in a minute. But this is a good intro to it, because I could be in your book. If you had interviewed me, you'd have this as one of the comments. Um, She said to me, within five minutes of learning that I was a Beatles fan, have you heard the new album? And of course, I didn't need any explanation. And I said, well, I happened to have bought Abbey Road last week. And she says, well, I've been on the road and I haven't been able to listen to it yet. 
And my answer, of course, was, well, I have the album downstairs in my room. Um, let's go downstairs and listen to it. So that was that evening. So that's part one of my little personal thing here. Here's another album you may recognize. And when I ran away from British boarding school um, at age 16, the week before I bought this album and I hid in the toilet of the train from Clandidno, Clandidno, North Wales, back to Euston Station in London for four and a half hours. I didn't have a ticket. I had no luggage, but I had this album. It's the only thing I ran away from school with. This is the that actual album. Ticket. So to say that I have some sort of connection to Beatle fandom is a, a, an understatement. So the funny thing is when you send me this book, you know, there's books and there's books and there's books. But since the Beatles played a huge role in my life in terms of my development away from my evangelical background, opening all these new doors, um, meeting my wife, Jeannie, uh, you know, we still play these old vinyl albums, the, the actual ones. And, and she then, when she, she married me, went back to the States for uh, a trip home, came back to Europe. And one of the only things she brought with her was all her vinyl which was her old American edition of the Beatles albums, which by the way, interesting footnote for you, was the first time that I knew that the British and American albums were different sometimes, which you talk about in your book. All right, enough personal stuff on me, but just to say that when I tell you, my listeners, to buy this book because Candy is a great writer and also gets the Beatles in a way and interviews all their fans in a way that is more of a revelation to those of us who try to le relive that. So having made that compliment, let me just give one example of what I'm talking about here. Um, and then we're gonna talk to you about the book. On uh, starting on page 143, you've got a whole thing, a splendid time, which is just your sort of three, four, five page review of Sergeant Peppers, which I've been listening to again recently for all those personal reasons I told you about. And I've read quite a lot about Sgt. Pepper's at the time it came out, because I wasn't one of those young fans that you talked to who were seven or eight years old and they were a little scared. I was I was exactly the right age. I was the teenager being raised on this stuff. So I'm 16 when it comes out and listening to the lyrics. Nobody had to explain to me they're important and so forth and so on. I've read a lot. So let me just give this one example that this section of your book. Um, is, is one of the most brilliant recountings in English language of a, of a piece of music that I've ever read, whether it's about an opera or a modern piece of music or whatever. I usually don't like, in fact, I'm allergic to writing about music and often writing about art because often it reads too much into it. And I, as a creative person, know I don't get up in the morning saying to myself, what shall I say today? I say, well, what shall I write or what shall I paint? It takes on a life of its own. And later philosophers and theologians and people dive in and get fine meaning. Your writing is so perfectly pure with none of that in it. I just loved it. And I'm gonna read one paragraph and I'm gonna shut the fuck up. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time picking your brains because I just love where you've gone with this. And you, you sum up the album in such a beautiful way. You say, despite its carnival atmosphere, that's Sgt. Pepper's, the record was calm, even mellow compared with the new American music of the moment, while bands like The Doors and Jefferson Airplane exuded tense, edgy urgency. Fans found Sgt. Pepper's dense and contemplative, its heaviness tempered with humor, humanity, and whimsy. And then I just want to tell you something. I think this is one of the greatest sentences that's ever been written about any piece of music or wow. any band. And I'm just telling, I'm being serious. Listen to this. It took itself as seriously as you wanted to think it did. And I just think that's a work, that is a line of goddamn genius because that's the Beatles. You in that one line said more about the Beatles than volumes that I've read about them. I just, my hat is off to you. Sorry, I don't have one to tip to you, but honestly, I get emotional saying this, I've never read a better line that describes anything in terms of art than that one line. You just nailed it. So Candy Leonard, thank you. You're, you're, you're brilliant, period. Well, thank you. Talk to me about thank the book. You. Thank you. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. I don't have a musical, uh, I have no formal training in music, yeah. music theory, musicology, none of that, but I'm a 
passionate consumer of music. And yeah. I think that, um, you know, people have said, no one has said quite what you had just said about my writing, but people have said that I talk about the music with a kind of, um, almost like an innocence, like a, yeah. a, a kind of very, almost impressionistically. And I think it's because I don't have that mm. background, but I feel it so strongly and powerfully mm. that I kind of find those were, you know, just, I don't know, but thank yeah. you for that. That's yeah. I, and I, I watch everything that's ever made on the Beatles, whether it's Ron Howard or blah, blah, blah. And I read a lot. And I've listened to all their music again and again and again, and I'm still listening to it. So, you know, that really comes from the heart. Now, I have I have a small detail question, so let's dive in here. Okay. I was struck by something that I found a little curious. I don't mean that in a bad way, but with your quotes from fans, you always put a birthday, and they reminisce about their age. Now, I guess because the Beatles sort of swam into my consciousness when I was about 11 or 12, and then really, you know, Sergeant Pepper comes out you know, when I'm whatever, 15 or 16, I don't relate very well to people whose memories of the Beatles are A, American, because I was in a British boys school, okay, mm -hmm. British boys school. So nothing that they needed explained to them needed to be explained to me because I was there. The second thing is, is it sort of struck me and very unusual getting seven and eight year olds memories of the Beatles because I guess because it hit me when I was sort of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and beyond. Um, I don't have any memory of being seven or eight and thinking anything about any rock band. So that exposure through early transistor radios of a big brother or sister wasn't happening to me because I was being raised in this sort of evangelical bubble. And when it occurred to me, I was a teen. So I just found that very interesting that you went there so often in terms of younger children's memories about not just the Beatles, but formative moments in American culture. I just thought it was fascinating. Can you unfold that a little bit and how you made the decision to quote so many people's what I would call younger children's memories of culture? I was expecting a, you know, young adult and teens. I didn't think of this, you know, when I dove into the book and started finding quote after quote of someone saying, well, when I was seven or when I was eight, it kind of struck me as different. How did that play out for you as you did your research? Well, I mean, I do interview fans across the age range. Uh, sure. People born between 1947 and I think the youngest fan I interviewed was born in 61. Um, but I mean, I myself was seven, but I, I do go across the range. I mean, part of it has to do with the way I recruited interviewees. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wanted to have a mixed, rep, a mixed, you know, just that get that whole continue, you know, across the age continuum. Yeah. But you know, I think people for, you know, we think about Beatle fans, we picture teenage girls, you know, that's like mm -hmm. the, the sort of archetypal Beatle fan. But I think if you look at their fan base during the height of the Beatle mania years, mm -hmm. The largest number of fans were, in fact, children, right? Mm. If you look at the, like, a, you know, the people born in, you know, what I call the mid-boomers, okay? Sure. So people born in, like, let's say, 53 or, 50, you know, like, 53, 54 to 56, mm -hmm. 57. That's the biggest chunk of our generation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I think part of the reason... I mean, there are obviously many reasons why we're still talking about the Beatles today. But one of the reasons is that this huge chunk of their fan base, of their really engaged fan base, was very mm -hmm. young. And so more impressionable. I mean, it's that simple. In other words, if, if, you're, if you have an influence in your life for mm -hmm. X amount of time, you know, and you have a, and you know, the longer you have that influence, the longer it's going to be. And so there was a, you know, like you were saying, like you're, you, um, something you said about sort of listening to music before that, or, or that, you know, you were already yes. older. And, and it's true that, you know, like if you were a teenager when the Beatles entered your life in 64, let's say in the US experience, you know, you were already listening to music. And, and so mm -hmm. they weren't, um, so of course, they were new and exciting and all the things that we talk about. 
but um, you were already a music listener. Maybe you already had a transistor radio. Maybe mm-hmm. you were already like dating and listening to music in your friends. But for many um, first generation Beatle fans, the, as I as we're saying that you know we were you know younger, and so it was we went from listening to like those plastic Disney records sure. or Alvin chipmunks you know or maybe uh i remember i used to listen to the soundtrack of uh west side story i mean we were we had music in our lives for sure Mm -hmm. but not our own music like this was for us like this was um made by young people of course Mm -hmm. you know the younger fans saw the beatles as older proportionally which is a whole other interesting thing but um yeah I mean a lot of the early fans were the first generation fans were really were were We're children and I think that that's part of why um that you know they opened our ears they they Mm -hmm. also created opportunities for us to you know socialize like everybody everybody on your block everybody in your neighborhood in your class loved the Beatles so they yeah, one you of know, the things I really love about, people to yeah. connect in that sense. Yeah, one of the things I really love about your book is that you step back once in a while, again and again through the text, and give us the social context. All of a sudden, you're reminding us we're in the Vietnam War at one point. Uh, you know, John Lennon's comments about being more popular than Jesus Christ are dropped into the sort of deep South, but it's the deep South of 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 battles over integration and so forth, so that. I love the way you kind of use your sociology, but without hitting us over the head with it, I guess it's the deep framework that you give everything kind of a historical context. But I wanted to bring up one thing that I wondered about this um, in terms of just the research you did for the book. It seems to me this is very much a book that is about the the United States, the the American phenomena of Beatleness, because yeah. I had two sort of different experiences than some of your fans here. One is just the fluky thing that I happened to be in British boarding schools from 1962 um, until I ran away from school whenever it was five years later, another one. So my vision of the Beatles was top of the pops. You know, this wasn't an import to me. This was the pop culture that I was in. I was an American in a boarding school, but we were in Britain. So the kinks and all these other hermits, hermits, all these people were, they were all right there. It wasn't an- You didn't have a British invasion. You were, they were already there. No, no, (laughs) exactly right. And then the other thing is, is growing up in this religious community of Labrie, uh, uh, the odd thing is, yes, it was an evangelical community, but because it was quote, ministering to young people, there was none of this sense that somehow long hair or being interested in this in the social aspects of what the Beatles were saying, or for that matter, Bob Dylan or Jefferson Airplane, any of these people. You know, one of the things that came through in your book, given that it's in the American context, was something that I, I didn't experience either in Labrie or in the UK, was not just the generation gap as it was hardening, but this idea that somehow the differentness of the Beatles with the haircuts and so forth appeared threatening to so many people and not just in the Bible belt. Um, And I just wanted to have you riff on that a little bit because it's a really interesting aspect of your book that kind of arcs to the present in terms of the same level of hysteria about, uh, you know, people that are leading us astray or cultural influences we don't like and so on. Um, It just seemed to be a very American theme to me um, that runs through your book. And I, I don't, I don't know if you were trying to make that point, but it certainly comes across that one of the aspects of the Beatles' friendliness and being liked so much because they didn't have that harder edge of, say, the Rolling Stones later and this kind of thing, was that they were able to transcend some of that American paranoia and xenophobia about non-American phenomena. And Mm -hmm. somehow the Beatles didn't, until people, of course, started calling Lennon a communist and this kind of thing later, because he was part of the peace movement. Can you talk about that a little bit? I don't even know. I don't know why I've rambled on on this, but it just struck me. Well, I mean, when they first, well, let me just say about the book. I mean, it does, it is about the, I mean, the fans I interviewed were all American fans, but the, you know, because I go through the whole sort of Beatles timeline um, and how fans experience and process the Mm -hmm. music, um, it it is in a sense universal. Like I've spoken to fans, like certainly in the UK and um, sure. and in Brazil. I've spoken, you know, fans who grew up in in Mexico, and that experience of you know that basic that that 
experience of embracing them, waiting mm. for the next record, you know, connecting with your, you know, that whole sort of sure. engagement. That, you know, is kind you know, what I, as I said, my book captures the American experience, but in some sense it was universal. But where you bring in the political aspects, I mean, I think the Beatles were political from the beginning. Sure and they people were, say yeah. oh, Revolution was their first political song. I mean, I, I disagree. I think that uh, the, their, uh, their whole, their appearance, their attitude, their sound, everything about them mm -hmm. was different and because they uh inspired i mean the very next day you know you know boys started growing their hair and yeah um you know embrace this notion of like permission that somehow they gave us permission you know mm -hmm. from the get-go and i think that you know if you so to to instill that feeling in you know 70 some odd million young people right yeah. and to grow hair i mean it that's a political that's political right i mean all later, later you show you you have an interesting example when they started showing up with beards on the later album covers you were talking about how it's at some point some of their fans were dropping away and then saying well kind of from that point on you know i like the monkeys better or something in other words there was an element of a countercultural rejection at some point by a more kind of middle class american bourgeois culture that even involved some of the young people that I found interesting and kind of different. And and don't don't let don't forget to, to address this. But one other little point that I don't want to forget to bring up, I found it intriguing that one of the quotes that you use in the book. And I should have stuck a post it in here, but you'll know which one I mean. Um, you're talking about how different people's views of the Beatles uh, were. And then you quote a fundamentalist pastor kind of denouncing them. Mm -hmm. Not exactly for sex, drugs, rock and roll, but for something similar to that. But you say, but actually in a weird kind of counterintuitive way, he got the point because they were actually far more countercultural and revolutionary than some people were allowing for. And I thought that was, you know, brilliant on your part to fish that out of that quote. Mm -hmm. But I think that combined with some of the, 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 their fandom at a later point taking a Beatles break, as you put it, a break from the Beatles or or going with other other people. There was a kind of a dividing of the paths um, where it became more obvious to, to folks that they were, you know, taking on a much more countercultural role. Can you sort right. of riff on yeah. some of that? Well, you know, I mean, as their music evolved, mm -hmm. you know, different people paid different kinds of attention to them. So, you know, at first it was, just, you know, I mean, the, I, mean we, I think we should say Ralph, it's important to recognize that the press loved them right yes. away. Loved, yeah. Well, loved writing about them anyway, made a little fun of them, made fun of their teenage, you know, the young, yeah. you know, very, very misogynist way, actually yeah. made yeah. fun yeah. of their, teenage, their young, their female fans. But as they evolved, certainly with, you know, A Hard Day's Night was critically acclaimed. I mean, yeah. with each thing they put out, they started to gain what I would call more cultural authority, mm -hmm. that they had to be taken seriously. And and as they and the things that they were presenting were more unusual, more challenging. Yeah. And, you know, and like you're talking about, you know, how this relates to sort of the monkeys and all that. I mean, those younger fans, let's say with Revolver. OK, that was really yeah, sure. weird. Start some younger fans like Revolver was just too much for them. Mm -hmm. OK, but in many cases, they didn't quite I didn't say like I don't like this it's almost it's more like I'm not ready for this yeah. or I'll I'll understand this while I'm a little older there was mm -hmm. this understand there was this sense that this was this was you know this music was great they were great they're an important part of my life yeah. and and they're and they you know so so but but so the monkeys kind of are interesting in that mm -hmm. right after Revolver, like two months, like a month after Revolver comes out, the TV, new TV season, the monkeys are on. And they were designed specifically for that purpose. I mean, sure. the people who created the monkeys recognized that, or I, th I think it was Queen Elizabeth who said the Beatles were getting strange or something like that. Like, yeah. so the, you know, the recognition that of that, and and so the, the monkeys filled that void. But what's really interesting, and I think important about the monkeys, I've written about this, is that the monkeys continued that countercultural mm -hmm. message. Yeah, and I found that fascinating. That the, part. It, but, you know, in that kind of more innocent looking, mm -hmm. you know, mop toppy sort of way. But if you look at 
the iconography and the the um aesthetics and the language everything mm -hmm. about the monkeys you know they they were hipsters they were hippies what? and they were giving that still yeah to they that still young audience. yeah so and that, they, so i found that very interesting consciousness was still happening yeah and you i know? found that interesting because i hadn't seen that i remember that when the monkeys tv thing started playing in the uk that those of us who were diehard Beatle fans hated it because it was basically like they're ripping us off. These are fake. And then, of course, you make the point that later they started writing their own songs and tried to really be something and carried through with that countercultural message. But, you know, go, going back to what you were saying about the press, you talk about Bosley Crowther, uh, the New York Times said the film was right. 90 crowded minutes of good, clean insanity and so forth and so on. You've got other places where you talk about the times and I think somewhat here where you're the media did love the Beatles because they were cheeky and they were lovely and so forth and so on and they gave them a lot of breaks but um, one of the subtexts of your book I find interesting is the sort of old guard establishment male white keepers of the gate the gatekeepers at the times and of course I was noticing in your book how you quote Time Magazine and Newsweek and these other people by the way, fast forward to the present. I'd like to see somebody write a book on anything today and quote anybody with authority as representing anything because the newspapers and the critics are gone. You know, I'm a writer. When my first novel came out, I guess I got 60, 70 reviews. There were 60 or 70 places to review books in those days. These days they don't exist. It's just tweets and comments on Amazon. And I know it's real, it's forth. interesting because it's hard to communicate to a, to a younger audience or a current audience. You know the significance of like that uh, Time magazine Time cover. God yeah. is dead, right? Like that was such. You remember, right? I mean, that was such a big deal. That was you know, a big like, deal. Or or that a and a, you know a, even even a film review would it, sure. it just had more import more import than it does today. And, and yeah, and when you quote all these authority figures of the moment for a younger audience. Uh, trying to explain to them, you know, is like trying to explain how one used to read maps when one was driving and had arguments with whoever was in the car with you because finding your way someplace was a big challenge. Right. Uh, and now they just have their phone. Well, similarly, when you say they were on the cover of Time or the New York Times said this or this journalist said that, I kind of get it. I wonder if younger readers will understand some of the structure of your book from that point of view. It's not a criticism, it's an inevitability because everything's moved so much. There are no authority figures anymore, not in that sense. Right, well, I mean, again, there there were, um, you know, there were three TV networks, you know, it's so like, for example, like when yeah. the Beatles were on television, if you weren't watching, you know, like if you didn't want to sure. watch that, like you had two other choices to watch. So, so the media environment is very, yeah. very different now. And with that comes change in who is an authority and, and who isn't. Yeah. Um, but you know they were everything they did was was I mean they was scrutinized by the press. I think you know the, the press corps. I think there was some genuine interest, but also it's they sold newspapers. I mean yeah. if you put the Beatles on the cover of your Newsweek or Life or Time or whatever it was, and that's still true to this day. You can yeah. go in you know there's special edition and people whatever they still sell magazines. So you know it, it was it was. They were everywhere. They were ubiquitous. And that's yeah. the that's the thing that I really tried very hard to capture in the mm -hmm. book, that how how ubiquitous they were and how important they became, not only to young people across mm -hmm. a wide age range, yeah. but to the culture itself. Like they they everything they did was scrutinized. Uh, they were, rec you know, the Time magazine did a cover story on hippies sure. in 1967. Yeah. Um, you know, which again may seem sort of quaint, but in fact, it was a really bizarre little episode there that this it, this migration of, you know, that whole movement. Yeah, the whole hate industry, whole but and also that they did their cover story on the drug culture and so on. Let me right. let me just uh, reintroduce you for a second here. There's uh, we're kind of. Uh, this is um, In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. I'm Frank Schaefer. This is Candy Leonard. We're talking about her book, Beetleness. Um, if you like this uh, podcast, please like it in the online interweb sense or whatever, um, and subscribe and so forth and so on. 
uh, help us out, spread the word and get in touch with Candy if you want to talk to her about this stuff. We'll put up her connect her website and all the rest of it. Let me uh, change gears for a minute here and just talk about what I find as the most fascinating subtext of this book, which, yeah. you know, if I was a publisher writing copy on the back, I would have mentioned this somehow. And I don't quite know how to say this, but if I was trying to explain modern America in terms of where we come from and who we are, wherever you touch on the zeitgeist of the moment, whether it's the Vietnam War or the drug culture or hate Asbury or the hippies or the relationship of music to culture, the rise of the counterculture, the way this generation started seeing itself different, Dr. Spock, people raised on Dr. Spock, how that supposedly changed things. You know, I think you've written an incredible history of the rise of modern America that's kind of, um, you know, a must read for people, you know, it, it's cloaked in this sort of lovely Beatleness thing. And like the Beatles themselves, this sort of cheery, cheeky way of doing it, which is your way as well, which is why the book is such a good read. And then you have all these lovely quotes from fans. But wow, you know, when you step it's back and give us a context, it's a, it's a, it's a history. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the I mean, it's a, you've given us a lens through which to see something, which if you just wrote a book on that, it would be, well, how are we getting into this? There's a lot of history books out there. There's a lot of books on American uh, culture. But, you know, you've written this incredible history of mid 20th century America and the phenomena that now reverberates right into the present. And by choosing the Beatles, who are sort of eternal, it's very clever. But you've got there's a lot more here than you would get from the subtitle, How the Beatles and Their Fans Remade the World. And by the way, a great history of the United States from this year to this year, plus well, an explanation of where the hell we are now. I mean, this is an incredible book. Thank you. I, 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 really, I really appreciate how you appreciate it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the book is about the Beatles, but it's not, I mean, the, it's really about our generation. It's about Absolutely. living through those times, mm -hmm the myriad influences, the confluence of technology, the politics, the drugs, the, the economy, which was booming. And this yeah. is why we all grew up with such great expectations and all that. I mean, it's really about, uh, I don't know, I say growing up boomer and, and how our generation, because of the sheer size of us, mm -hmm. okay, there's so many of us were impacted by I want to be careful how I say this. I mean, the Beatles, yes, but really it's the nest. That's why it's Beatle right. nest. It's the, it's the atmosphere, the environment, zeitgeist mm -hmm. that happened around them in their wake and that they both fueled and reflected. People say, oh, did they, oh, were they reflecting the times or were they agents of change? Well, they were both, you yes. know? Yes, yes. And, and so it's, the book is, really about it, it is it's a it's a history i mean sometimes i describe it as a history of the 1960s through the eyes of young people engaged mm -hmm. with the beatles and pop but, music. but it's the young people that then grew up and essentially ran the western world for the next 50 years and in the case of our current president and his nemesis in donald trump are still shaping things you know we're all the more or less the same generation which of course a lot of younger people resent but in explaining the power of the boomer generation, something you bring out very well, I forget the exact statistic, maybe you remember what you cited in your book, but you were talking about the fact that at that time, what was it, something like 60% of the population were 25 years of age or under, I mean, there was an incredible sort of bubble of youth so that, you know, if you basically are the most influential thing to a youth movement, at a time when youth is the majority of the population, now you're yeah. now you got something going. Exactly. And I just find fact, that fascinating. Time, time magazine named Boomers their person of the year. Um, yes, I remember that. And yeah. it's yeah. a really interesting uh take. In fact, I wrote a comment on it, a commentary on it in 2017 at the 50th anniversary of it. And you know, um, not all boomers were Beatle fans and and um, and not all, um, you know, the, I mean, a lot has happened since then. Right. So, like, you know, the the um, change in consciousness that the Beatles brought about is not necessarily reflected in our 
in it's in, certainly reflected in some of our politics, but not all of it. And, you know, this gets to this whole sort of boomer bashing thing, you know, mm -hmm. that's been happening the last few years with OK Boomer and all that. Yeah. I think that. You know, people say, oh, you were so idealistic and all that. You all became selfish and greedy and fucked up the world. Well, not exactly, because if you look at it closely, um, you know, Clinton was the first boomer president, right? Mm -hmm. And he swung right because so many, you know, the, the Washington establishment, Gingrich, all those guys like disliked him so much because he was a boomer, dared to smoke pot, dared to protest the war. So he kind of swung a little right. And then, you know, um, Bush, Bush Jr. Um, surrounded himself with sure. his father's World War II guys, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of like mm -hmm. what we might want to call boomer consciousness, we didn't get that in the Oval Office until right. maybe a little bit with Obama. Yes. And, and so when people say, oh, boomers fucked up the world, you know, they did Earth Day, but now they don't give a shit about the environment. Again, I, I would say in defense of our generation, who hmm. made energy policy over the course of this century? Not boomers. Right. World WW2 generation. Yeah, but I'd go the, even further and I would say that, and, I, and this is not in your book, I mean, directly, but I'd like to, I'd like your opinion on this. Um, and I'm not stating my opinion, I'm just throwing an idea out there. But I, it seems to me that arguably one could say, look, the, the boomer, the actual, the real boomer revolution that the Beatles were so much a big part of, you know, e e even for people who weren't their fans, they opened doors to things they were fans of. For instance, environmental consciousness, uh, treating the planet with more gentleness, which was the hippie thing, being less consumeristic, which was the hippie thing. Yeah. You know, in a way, the pushback from the American establishment. Let me say one more thing. Not only was it a hippie thing, but these are also in the Port Huron statement yes, that the sure. SBS put out. In, it was 62, I think that was. So these ideas, young people were trying to get these ideas out there. Right. And, and what I what I and per perfectly said, but what I want to add to that is I think that we have consistently underestimated in so many areas how corporate America has co-opted movements mm -hmm. and done some version of greenwashing mm -hmm. where all of a sudden they move in, they take some terminology, they use it to sell product. But the fact of the matter is, I think the great tragedy, the booming generation, and again, I'm just throwing this out as an idea, but it's one I, I sort of think is maybe right uh, in some way, although it's overgeneralized. The tragedy of the boomer generation is that the pushback they got from corporate America, the parental generation, if you like, who was suspicious of the Beatles, if you want to put it that way, was so powerful uh, and cataclysmically fatal that the beginnings of the environmental movement were smashed. Uh, by the oil corporations that brought all that false uh, testimony and research to, to back up the idea, you know, very similar to smoking is good for you. You know, the cigarette companies moved in. In the end, people learned the truth about cigarettes. In the end, we learned the truth about oil and carbon fuels. But the pushback was so powerful, so well-funded, that the poor little old millionaire Beatles were dealing with trillionaires. The boomer generation did not know what hit them because so many of our slogans and everything else were co-opted by corporate America. And I think where you see it most clearly, and now I know I'm on very dangerous ground, is the way so much of the feminist movement was co-opted by corporate America, where all of a sudden, the real purpose of corporate America, uh, bending a little bit toward feminism linguistically, you know, was to staff their HR departments with people who had been told that um, you can't balance career and children, don't demand anything so stupid as paid parental leave, instead just, uh, you know, make the choice in favor of career, and isn't that after all what feminism is, but it wasn't. Feminism was about a lot more than simply feeding at the male white trough, and corporations kept doing this to us, whether it was feminism, or the counterculture, suddenly it becomes a fashion industry. What I'm, what I'm getting at there is the, the boomers didn't win. The, 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 movement, the, the movement the Beatles helped hatch, lost. And I agree. all the I way mean, up until the election of Donald Trump. I mean, I, this doesn't come from us. Yes, I, I, I most, I think I most, I think there are bright spots, but in general, I agree with you. I think the real tragedy 
for our generation, in fact, for the world, for humanity, was yes. um, well, maybe I'm over. Well, the assassination of, of Bobby Kennedy was a major, major uh, right. point in all of this. I believe, and others believe this too, although some disagree, but historian, that had he, he, had he not been assassinated hmm. and had he become president, which is fairly likely he would have, Given the way you know the the demographics that we and and vote and all that, um, even though that we were still eighteen year olds still could not vote then, believe, which is so crazy to think about, but um, we would be living in a different America now mm. had Bobby Kennedy not been assassinated. Mm. Imagine for I mean like it's a thought experiment, but okay, so no, we would have gotten out of Vietnam faster, which would have had a lot of positive, you know the all the thing, good things that would have come from that. No, no Watergate, no, you know, and all the distrust of government and, and all that, mm. that, arrived about, that arose around that. I mean, I believe that we would be living in it, that this country would be more like the social democracies of Europe, Northern Europe. You know, we would have universal health care. We'd have pre-K. We would have, I believe, I, maybe I'm, you know, fantasizing and not... Mm. But I believe we would have a lot of these things. Uh, we, we would be more like these other nations in terms of these social welfare uh, mm -hmm. things. But when Reagan came in um, and said, you know, turned everybody against government and that government has no role. And, you know, the worst things you can say, I'm from the government, I'm here to help, you know, and all the deregulation and the union smashing and all the things that happened in, you know, what's typically referred to as the neoliberal era, which we're still in, mm -hmm. um, that really kind of put an end in a lot of ways to a to that trajectory. Now there are still uh, there's been resistance all along, so we're able you know little bits here and there. There's been progress, of course, you know, but I think that um, the the last forty plus years have been you know in terms of the um, quality of life for average Americans. It, it, you know, there's there's been this. Focus on, you know, I mean, to say, you know, profits over people like is like an understatement and it's mm -hmm. getting worse. I mean, the whole work, you know, just the constant work culture and then throw on top of that with the advent of um, the Internet, social media, um, you know, the the there's a. Um, there's a change in American life that is not um, conducive to well-being, to, mm -hmm. to say the least. And I think that that really started the, the, that trajectory started with Reagan and with the changes that that he brought about. So, but, okay, so we had a couple of Democratic presidents since then, but they were not able to. Mm -hmm to bring it back to the trajectory we would have been on had Kennedy not been assassinated. I mean, that's kind of my, I mean, I'm sort of saying it quickly, but that's kind of the way I see it. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a, I've been doing a lot of research on this for something I was working on. And, you know, there's a lot of um, research now on the mental health consequences of neoliberalism and neoliberal poli policies around the world, you know, in the, particularly the UK and here, but all over. And, um, you know, this individualist, you're on your own, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, there's no loyal, it's just, it's just a different world. And mm -hmm. I think that um, our generation, you know, like, it's like, I think there's a lot of not okay boomers out there mm -hmm. who see this and like, well, what happened? Like we, you know, like why are we now facing, you know, climate collapse? Right. When 50 years ago, we were onto this problem, mm -hmm. you know. Way, and way, so, way onto it, way ahead of the game, too. I mean, in hindsight, right. but they weren't listening to us. Right. But what's it's interesting to think about that Richard Nixon started the EPA, mm -hmm. you know. Exactly. So, you know, the, the um, you know, the, the, sh the shift in, uh, you know, what's seen as like, what can what can we do here in this country for, for as far as policy is just, it's really shifted so far to the right. Hmm. And although I should say, I'm very happy about the, I mean, I'm relieved, I should say, about the midterms. It could have been a lot worse, but okay. So how does this relate to the Beatles? Of course, everything in one way yeah. or another relates 
the Beatles as we know. Yeah. But it does because I mean I I think that they appeared at a time where we were things were changing in a direction uh, towards inclusivity, <clears throat> personal freedom, personal expression, expansion of rights, e expansion of consciousness itself, which mm. is super important. And we should maybe talk more about that. But, um, you know, and so there was this feeling of, you know, like we had great expectations, right? The economy sure. was booming. We believed in science. We got to the moon. It was a time of great optimism, which is also reflected in the music, which I think is why the music is still so uh, popular. You know, people love 60s pop music. I was with people this weekend at Ladies Rock Camp, some of the younger participants, and like people love 60s pop music. Why? Because it's pop, it's it's optimistic, it's uplifting, it's aspirational, it's a lot about love and and you know. And, and there's been research on this showing how lyrics over the years have changed, that it's darker, it's just, mm -hmm. it's a whole different thing. So, you know, we grew up during a renaissance, basically, is, did, is kind yeah. of how it is. It's a pop well, music know, renaissance, I, but it was also a cultural renaissance. Yeah, and the, but the point you're making, I think, and, and the point I was making really, I think, mesh very well, because the fact of the matter is, you know, both of us were there. I'm a little older than you, I think, and I was there. Um, and you know, if you try if you try putting you, you know, uh, kind of a context on this, if you think of those in the South when they were burning Beatles albums because of John Lennon's comment, if you think of the reaction to a black president being Donald Trump, I see the same thing happening there. And that is, I think what really happened was that the counterculture that the Beatles were so much part of and that was so good in so many ways. Um, was first of all uh, taken over by corporate America and and this kind of greenwashing effect. So the, the beginnings of the environmental movement were dis, were squashed by the oil companies um, and so forth. But I think it was more than that. And that is, America has something unique. You talk about the difference with Western Europe, um, and that is, we have this subculture of powerful right wing evangelical white voters who have always been there, whether it's to burn the Beatles albums because of a misunderstood quote by John Lennon, or a gen few generations later, elect Donald Trump in reaction to a black president, or now refuse to accept an election based on the fact that since they feel their guy has been appointed by God, he couldn't have lost. And so they believe the big lie. You know, everybody wants to be polite about religion, but the fact of the matter is, the microcosm of what happened to John Lennon when they burnt the Beatles albums because of what he said has snowballed out through our history until you see the Capitol being invaded by another set of reactionaries mm -hmm. who in a sense are burning down our democracy because they didn't get their way. I think whether it's the assassination of Martin Luther King or the Kennedys or anything else, the, 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 the atmosphere that creates that type of violence always relates back to a religious absolutism at the heart of America that is poison in our culture. I and as long, as long as that evangelical population is not answered and basically identified as what they are, which is an anti-democracy movement based on a mythical foundation, then what the Beatles were doing here always is gonna run into this counter-revolution. And that's what happened to what the boomers are trying to do. That's what I think is the heart of the matter. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the resistance to change comes from a lot of places, and certainly religion is one of them. I mean, you know, I mean, my thinking about religion has, you know, I mean, I, I consider myself very much a spiritual person, even more so than recently. I mean, over the sure. pandemic, I've explored a lot of things, and. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, religion is, is a, it's a reactionary retrograde uh, uh, institution. Um, and for the most part, I mean, there are exceptions, but for the most part, and, and uh, it, it does, I don't understand, like, you know, it, I don't, it, a lot of it to me gets back to, even religion gets back to a scarcity mindset, a patriarchal scarcity mindset, Mm -hmm. that which also underlies capitalism and 
if you have people believing there's not enough for our group and our our group is really different than your group because you know this otherizing and the scarcity mindset fuels the otherizing right because it's like we have to protect ours like we're not going to have enough like if they take it you know and and so I, I think that you know religion perpetuates kind of the worst in us because it it the otherizing and and the scarcity I think is you know what the, I've done a lot um reading about religion I'm not claiming you know like you're no, obviously no more way more about this than I do but it seems to me as an outside observer that all these religions are basically saying ultimately the same thing right I wrote a piece actually about Beatles fandom as a de facto secular religion, which is in a, it's a, in an academic volume on the Beatles. And in researching this, um, it just, you know, I learned a lot and, you know, Aldous Huxley talked about the perennial sure. philosophy. Okay. And that's kind of what the Beatles were, were putting forth in some sense, you yeah, know, particularly and they, when they got more into the, um, yeah. The consciousness stuff, and you know, George particularly. In, in I think a lot of evangelicals resented that instinctually, in the sense that the very fact that there were these four happy secular people who were talking about essentially what evangelicals claim as their own shtick, which is love your neighbor, take care of the planet, and then, but the Beatles were talking about all this without the references to Jesus, and then without that right wing racist spin that has characterized so much of white evangelicalism. Look, you know, Jeannie and I got married very young, 17, 18, she was pregnant. We would not have survived as a couple had it not been for the care of the evangelical community we happened to be in. In mm -hmm. fact, one of the reasons I left the evangelical world is I started comparing big time American religion to that small ministry my parents had before they got famous. And weirdly enough, the kind of people who were showing up at Labrie, all could have been quoted in this book, many of them, because they were kids during the Beatle era, very much of the counterculture, hippies and so forth and so on. So it isn't that all evangelicals were opposed to this. You know, my dad was giving lectures on Bob Dylan's lyrics and, you know, I was playing Beatles albums. But the fact of the matter is that kind of reactionary thread in America that burnt Beatles albums because of what Lennon said, that then elected Trump because they didn't like a black president that now has believed a lie about our democracy being broken in terms of election machines so that they can always win even when they lose elections. That thread was very much running through your book in terms of some of the reaction to the Beatles. And I just want to say it again, and I don't, you know, I, 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 I think that this is very arguably so. And that is the, the, the idealistic boomer generation lost the ideological battle, or should we say it is still being waged 50, 60 years later um, and nothing has changed. They're still burning the albums as it were, metaphorically speaking, yeah, in another it. context. And the fight continues. You know, John well, Lennon was sh shot, Martin Luther King was shot, the Kennedy brothers were killed. There was a real ideological war there. 50,000 people who died in Vietnam from the American side cannot be brought back. I mean, this has been a real, more than simply a cultural phenomenon. This has been a real war and, and it's had real victims. And those victims continue now with global warming because we listen to the oil companies and not to the people that the Beatles were advocating in terms of their more environmental, John Lennon's more environmental view of things and so forth. So I just think it's, this, is, this book is part of a huge story that is still engulfing us. Thank again. I thank you for. I appreciate your appreciating. You know what I set out to do. I mean, it's interesting. You know, when you say that the boomers lost, because I mean, I, I think a lot of people would would disagree with that for various reasons. But we, but in, in some fundamental sense, I, I really I agree with you at, at, that we we lost. We, we it appears like on a very superficial level. You know, the fact that you know long hair on men. You know, I mean, we. The, a lot of good things came out of all of that. Okay, sure. there is more personal freedom. There is more freedom of expression. You know, the Beatles created an atmosphere. I think that helped pave the way for Stonewall to happen. I mean, I sure. think there were a Absolutely. lot of things that happened at that time. And again, it's not only the Beatles, but you know, again, they were 
big drivers of it. People say, well, what about Dylan? Well, yes, but Dylan did not have the megaphone mm -hmm. across an 18 year age range of, of fans yeah. globally that the Beatles had. Um, so, you know, there was some important change that, that came about. Um, yes. but you're right. There, there is this, this, um, you know, yeah, there's this very reactionary thread that, that, you're, you know, is absolutely still operating. Um, and yeah, I, uh, and I think a lot of the, I don't understand a lot of the, um, sort of dislike of boomers you know the, the very word itself boomer right. has become an ageist epithet it really right. has mm -hmm. because we represent i don't know now they're saying selfishness greed uh, i don't care about anybody else and that's just, that's just not true i mean i i think that at its core again like not all boomers were hippies i get that sure, and not no, all boomers no. were hippies, although all hippies were probably Beatles fans. but mm -hmm. but th there was a consciousness that erupted that e that emerged at that mm -hmm. time um that was in the direction of simpler way a better world more opportunity self-expression so some of these things did hold over like i used to joke around well you know casual friday at work like thank the beatles you know you can trace these right. things back you know this this notion of you know this you know just permission that's the word that people use the beatles gave mm -hmm. us permission yeah. and lots of things now some people say well this this was see this all as a big problem the people burning the records you know who are the same people now like you point out or their their sure. uh their ideological you know, descendants yes yes but you but, know you i know, i just want to interject one thing and yeah. and, and then I'm, I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up in a second but um I think as we look at the the present era we were in, it's not so much just that the boomers lost, but the idealism of the boomers was was um, how can I put it this way? It was taken over by corporate America, you know. So we were all wearing blue jeans, and then all of a sudden Calvin Klein shows up, you know. We, you know, w women were supposed to be able to be, and then Victoria's Secret shows up, and then it all turns out these are being run by occasionally by boomers, but where you really see the departure and where we really lost was in the techie generation that all of a sudden Ayn Rand and this idea of the great American male entrepreneur libertarian gets lifted up. And what do you know, half these billionaires are now going to the far right and funding the Republican Party, people like Thiel and Musk and all these other guys. It's not coincidental. You know, they weren't exactly, they're not album burners or book burners, but they are certainly as far away from what John Lennon was talking about as you can get. They are not just of the right, but they're of this sort of libertarian idea of profit uh, at any cost, you know, right. fire 10,000 employees with a tweet. You don't even bother sending them an email, let alone right. meeting and, with right. helping so them. And that's not people. boomers. That's not right. boomers. That is right. The, that is that reactionary, right-wing, libertarian, don't tread on me movement that is as far away from what the Beatles were and the idealism on Haight-Ashbury and all the rest for, uh, with all its faults as you can get. So the idea of, of, of drawing a straight line from the boomers to this generation of techie greed is ridiculous. These are a completely different breed of animal. It's true. It's true. Now, it'd be interesting, you know, if Steve Jobs was alive, he was a huge Beatle fan. He, like many, traveled to India. India, inspired by them, used LSD, all that. You know, yeah. there, there was a link between the hippies and the early tech, the early okay. tech. It'd be interesting to see, you know, what, how he, you know, whether he would have gone to the, you know, become right wing as well. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, our generation, you know, now, now we're like elder, older adults, you know, and, and uh, people say, okay, well, just retire so we can take over your, your positions. But I think a lot of us are really in a lot of despair when we look out at the world right. as it is today. And, you know, what, you know, as somebody who studies Beatles and Beatles fandom in its historical context and that whole generation, like, I wish there were some way to leverage Beatles fandom really across generations, but particularly among you know older uh, you know first generation fans to to re revitalize that feel that uh, sense of you know we need to make the world better. We need to you know that, you know like we 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 were a very powerful force. That's the thing. You know Nixon 
put Lenin on his enemies list right, because right. he knew how powerful he was. Sure. You know, the, the people who burned the records down south, the, the whole reaction to Lenin's comments about, you know, Jesus and all that just proves how scared they were and how, you know, the truth, you know, how powerful and how, uh, you know, the Beatles were at such a, a, an influence. So yeah, and their ideological descendants showed up at our capital 50 years later with a noose for the vice president of the United States who wanted to maintain our democracy for a few minutes. You know, my my producer Ernie has just sent me a little note saying pass down the, the Beatles gospel, you know, so that's that's sort of what we're talking about here. Gospel, okay. I mean, so, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, there, there is, I mean, I, I wrote a piece on this, there'll be a link to it about like, there is a, there is a philosophy within the Beatles, I believe right. that, that can be, you know, like a, a, a very clear, you know, sort of, um, philosophy, let's call it that. But yeah, I mean, the, the, their influence is going to continue. I mean, even on like Twitter today, there's like, you know, there's just fans of all ages just wanting to understand more, learn about them. Right. And, well, we've uh, got the book here for them. So listen, let me just say this. Frank Schaefer, In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. This is a Facebook Live event. It will be back on Facebook and YouTube. And Ernie, please put this one up quickly and let's let's really push the hell out of it because I, I love the book and, and my guest today is terrific. So let's do everything we can for Candy Leonard and let people know about this book. And, and um, if you're interested in our culture, our politics, where we all come from, uh, loving or hating boomers and uh, want to know about the Beatles and everything that happened in and around them from the Vietnam War to the to 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 the assassination of our of some of our heroes. It's here it is. So Beatleness by Candy Leonard, how the Beatles and their fans remade the world. Um, I love the book. I just think you're a terrific writer. I want to stay in touch. I hope we can talk about other things sometime because you have so much good things to say. Thanks for writing this book, Candy. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. And again, I appreciate you appreciating it very much. I love it. I love it. Like is not the right word. I love this book. I just love the way it flows. And I love everything you bring into it. I think it can be read on about five levels. I'm glad I lived enough of it to understand a good chunk of it. Thank you for writing it. And everybody, you can, you, you will, uh, Ernie's going to put all the links up so you can follow Candy after this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.